Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's lesson brought to you guys by STEM, Lockdown Digital School. Today, I'm going to be teaching you guys English first additional language, and I'm going to be focusing on my grade 10. Today, we are doing reading and viewing and seeing poetry. And as always, I am your favorite English grade 10 teacher, Miss Pearl Langa. Welcome, welcome everyone. Today's lesson is going to be jam-packed with a lot of new information for some of you guys. Um, and for some of you guys, it's going to be recap and revision. So welcome, welcome, welcome. Right, so today we are doing unseen poetry. And what this means is we are doing a poem and I'm saying it's unseen because this is English first additional language. Hello everyone. And we don't usually do a lot of poetry in English first additional language. However, I figured today that I should introduce it to you guys as the new concept so that many of you guys learn something new. Right. Who is ready for today's lesson? Hello, 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 everyone. Okay, Sarah is ready. I'm also ready. Phyllis is ready. Let's get right into today's lesson. I see Lionheart is ready as well. And I'm sure some of our other friends will be joining us as we move along. Right, so big shout out. I see Megan is excited today. Um, Kian is also ready. Um, today, I have a very, very, very big shout out to a learner who submitted um, their agenda and their minutes to a meeting. And this learner is Mufeto Di Tlapane. She submitted her agenda and I went through it very quickly and I noticed that it was perfect. Well done, Mufetori. Um, and I also looked at the minutes and I saw that they were also seamless and perfect. So thank you so much, Mufetori, for submitting your work. I went through it. Oh, it's Tiro. Well done, Tiro. Thank you so much for submitting your work. Um, and congratulations for being successful at doing yesterday's task. I am very, very proud of you. Thank you so much for submitting, Tiro. And for all of you guys who have not submitted as yet, please make sure that you submit your work um, and I will share my English, uh, my email address at the end of the lesson. So if you still want to send me anything that we have done before, make sure that you send it to me directly via my email address. Well done, Tero. I see the, the class is proud of you today. Right. Let's quickly recap on yesterday's work. If you missed out on yesterday's work, yesterday we did an agenda and minutes to a meeting. And we said that when writing an agenda um, and minutes, remember the following steps. And we went through steps one to four. So step one was you must choose a topic. Step two was you must plan for your topic. Step three, you must write down your draft. You must edit your draft. Um, and step four, you must present your final draft. And we just looked at Theodore's work just now. And I believe that he followed all of the steps to ensure the successful completion of his agenda and minutes. And I'm sure most of you guys did it at home as well. Um, so if you did it at home and you haven't submitted it, there's still time to submit. Welcome to read. Let's quickly look at work that we'll be doing today, guys. Um, today, you will know the different poetic devices that exist. You will know the purpose of poetic devices. You will know what we learn from po poetry. You will know how to analyze poetry and how to build meaning and life lessons from poetry. So poetry is a very, very, very fun part um, of the English subject. This is where we get to enjoy it. And I see Megan said she was excited for today's lesson because she thoroughly enjoys poetry. And today I'm just hoping to evoke everyone's side of that so that we all enjoy poetry right are you guys ready for today's lesson are you ready are you ready are you ready right i see lionheart is ready and i'm sure all of you other guys are ready as well let's get to it okay so quick shout out to the textbook we have used 
for today's lesson. Um, so the textbook we've used is Shutter's English Home Language Poetry Anthology for Grade Tens, um, and this is a free ebook from Snaplify. So shout out to Shutter's and Shooter textbooks for making this textbook available on um, Snaplify for us. Right, I see a lot of you learners are saying you love poetry, but you hate Shakespeare. And maybe before the end of the week, I could sneak in some Shakespeare to show you guys that it's not so bad at all. Let me quickly introduce you guys to poetry. Right, so introduction to poetry. They say here, poetry is a form of, let me go back. Poetry is a form of literature that uses aesthetic. And aesthetic is usually like beauty, love language okay and often rhythmic qualities of language such as phono aesthetics and phonesthetics are how beauty and language um and 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 nature sound so the word for phone comes from the word phone which means sound um and this is how aesthetics sound so it also uses sound symbolism and meter to evoke meanings in addition to, or in place of the prosiac, ostensible meaning. So this is a definition I've got from Wikipedia, which in short basically means that poetry is literature that uses a lot of rhythmic elements, uses a lot of sound, uses a lot of meter in order to create a beautiful meaning. Okay, and if we look at the picture below, it says that with poetry, the writer, the heart, touches the reader's heart. So that's why we all love poetry, right? And with other texts, the writer's heart um, is very intellectual, and we all have to take from that intellect in order to um, make sure that the text appeals to us. So it's not like poetry, whereas with poetry, we immediately relate to the poem that we're reading. Right, let's quickly look at the different devices used in poetry first before we start with today's poem. So we have rhyme. Who can tell me what rhyme is? What is rhyme? Who can give me an example of rhyme then? Cat, hat, um, Lionheart says rhyme is rhyming. <laughs> um, Lionheart, how about this? Rhyme is when words sound the same. So they say here, Valentine mine. Well done, Valentine. That's nice. I've never seen that one before. Okay, so rhyme is the repetition of sounds. Okay, so you get an end rhyme, the last words on each line rhymes, or an internal rhyme, the words inside the sentence rhyme and more examples are coming in valentino casino tiger liger fight might so there's a lot of words that rhyme i see plain stain talk walk and here we are given examples like hat hat and here's an example of a poem that has a lot of rhyming words and it says my beard by shell silver my beard to my toes i never wears no clothes I wraps my hair around my bed and down the road I goes. So here on the specific poem, we have an internal rhyme and we have an external rhyme. And the internal rhyme could be the words grows and toes. Toes and clothes could also rhyme. Hair and bear rhyme and goes, clothes, toes also rhyme. Um, write and write. Tino, we don't refer to write and write as rhyming words. However, we refer to them as homonyms. No, homophones. 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 Okay. Homonyms are words that are spelled the same but have different meanings. Homophones are words that sound the same but have different meanings. Right. Okay, let's move on to the next one. Alliteration. Who knows what an alliteration is? Who can tell us what an alliteration is? Okay, I don't think anyone knows this. Constant repetition of what, Tyrese? 
Yes, concept repetition, but of what? Of consonant sounds, not of vowels, of consonant sounds. The repetition of beginning, consonant. Well done, guys, you guys know. Okay, so the repetition of the initial letter or sound in two or more words in the line is referred to as an alliteration. Someone said coconut. <laughs> That's, as long as you know that it's not coconut, it's consonant. Okay, right, and here are examples um, to the lay person. These are called tongue twisters. Okay. So here's an example of a tongue twister. Don't laugh at me. It says, how much do you, would a dew drop drop if a dew drop did drop dew? And I'm going to try that one more time for you guys. How much dew would a dew drop drop if a dew drop did drop dew? And if you look at this example, it's a repetition of the letter D. D from dew, another D from dew, then drop, then drop, dew, dew. Do drop, did drop, do. And I see more examples like uh, the red fox frolicked to the forest. Yes, Lionheart, <laughs> that's a very good example. But try it out at home. Can you do this tongue twister without twisting your tongue? How much do you would a dew drop drop if a dew drop did drop do? And I see Monica says, Sally, sir. Sally sells she sells Sally sells seashells by the seashore. That is a real tongue twister. <laughs> but you guys get alliteration, right? Oh, Lionheart says his tongue already twisted. <laughs> Mine did too, especially with Monica's tongue twister. Um, and Tina says he's bad with tongue twisters. I'm terrible. I had to practice this one before the lesson, so that's why I'm good. Right, let's do the next. Okay, let's see how it looks in a poem. So, she walks in beauty. She walks in beauty like the night of cloudless climes and stirry skies. And all that's best of dark and bright meet her aspect and her eyes, thus mellowed to that tender light which heaven to gaudy day denies. And we can already see that in the specific poem, we have cloudy climbs as an alliteration because those two words start with the letter C. We have stirry skies as well. Both of those words start with the letter S. Then we have day denies. So remember with an alliteration, the words have to come one after the other and they all have to start with the same letter. So two or more words, right? Let's move on to the next one. Who can tell me what an onomatopoeia is? What is an onomatopoeia? Sound words. Well done, Tari. Sound words, right? Like bang, bang. Monica said sounds. So words that spell out sounds. For example, growl, hiss, pop, boom, crack. And the last one, this one with the P T T H H H B B B, is actually it's like a farting sound. So the last one is like a fart sound. <laughs> I'm not farting. I'm using my mouth. If you look at the picture of the girl on the right hand side, she has, she has a tongue out and she's making that. Sound like you're blowing through your tongue type of sound. <laughs> I thought it was a cool one to add. That's why Lionheart. Um, and I thought you guys would enjoy it. Yeah, like blowing raspberries. She's blowing raspberries. So that's how it sounds when you blow raspberries. Try, Megan. Try. It's like blowing through your tongue. Right. Let's move on to the next slide. Okay, let's see what it looks like in a poem. Okay, this is Noise Day by Shal Silverstein. And it says, let's have one day for girls and boys when you can make the grandest noises. Screech, scream, holler and yell, buzz a buzzer. 
clang a bell, sneeze, hiccup, whistle, shout, laugh until your lungs wear out, toot a whistle, kick a can, bang a spoon against a pan, sing yodel, bellow, hum, blow a horn, beat a drum, rattle a window, slam a door, scrape a rake across the floor. So, Oh, onomatopoeias used in the specific poem are screech, buzz, clang, toot, bang, and rattle. Someone says holler. If you holler, you are calling someone out. Like, hey, that's what holler means. Yeah, it's part of the ghetto. <laughs> well, we've been made to believe it's part of the ghetto when you holler. But really, everyone hollers. I just hollered. Right, let's look at the next one. Okay. Simile. Who can tell me what a simile is? What is a simile? As and like. Comparison using the words like or as. Yes, we all got it. So a comparison between two usually unrelated things using the word like or as. So for example... Joe is as hungry as a bear. In the morning, Ray is like an angry lion. Um, and Lionheart just gave us an example here. I run as fast as a cheetah. Um, Tino said, you are like a star. Yes, that's a beautiful one. And usually we use similes to kind of emphasize someone's character. So for example, Tino's example, if you say someone is like a star, you mean that person is amazing, that person is bright, that person is happy, or that person is smart. Okay, because we view stars as something perfect. I dance like Michael Jackson. Okay. I see I mew. I meow like a lion. Meow. Like, do lions meow? I think they growl. Lion heart, <laughs> but I know they are cats, they're cats, um, but they don't meow. Maybe cubs meow. And Tyree says he's um as smooth as Michael Jackson. Ooh, nice one. Let's move on to the next one. So get in, in a poem. Okay. Here's an example. Okay. Um, a poem should be palpable and mute as a clubbed fruit, silent as a sleeve worn by stone of casement ledges where the moss has grown. A poem should be wordless as the flight of birds. And we have here our first simile, which is mute as a clubbed fruit, silent as a sleeve worn stone and as the flight of birds. So those are examples of similes in poetry. Let's move on to the next one, metaphor. Who can tell me what a metaphor is? Comparing things without the use of like or as. So we compare things, but we don't say like. So for example, we could say, Miss Langa is a lion because maybe Miss Langa is me, but Miss Langa is not me, she's very nice. Yes, Monica, that is a beautiful example. You are an angel. Okay, so they are telling you what you are. You are directly comparing things. Well done, um, Tino. You are directly telling. <laughs> Tyree says, I'm a lion. I'm not a lion. <laughs> Lionheart says, he's a cool lion. Mm. Yeah, Lionheart. Let's see. Right, so a metaphor is an implied comparison between two usually unrelated things. Um, for example, here they say Lemmy is a snake. And usually when they say someone is a snake, this is someone who you cannot trust. Guinea is a mouse when it comes to standing up for herself. And that basically means um, Guinea is um, frightened. But um, um, she, she can't stand up for herself. Right. Um, and there, we know what a metaphor is. And they say there in our little club, the difference between a simile and a metaphor is that a simile requires either like or as to be included and a metaphor requires neither to be used. All right, next slide. Hyperbole. So we don't pronounce it as a hyperbole. That is very incorrect. We call it hyperbole in mathematics. 
but in English, we call it a hyperbole. And a hyperbole is an exaggeration for the sake of emphasis. So basically an over exaggeration. Yes, an extreme exaggeration. So um, if you say, <laughs> if you say, um, uh, what is this? Um, uh, I forgot of any examples, but here, oh, here are examples. I may sweat to death. Has anyone ever sweat to death? No. She needs some milk. Hmm, that is not an over exaggeration. It took you a hundred years to get here, is an over exaggeration. So try another one, Megan. Try another one. Yes, so it, it can't possibly take anyone a hundred years to get here. I'm so hungry I could eat a cow. Well done. Nelly says, I will die of hunger. Nelly, this one you must use with caution because if you don't have food for a very long time, you could die of hunger. But if you have food right in front of you and you say you're going to die of hunger, then it's an over exaggeration. I cried my lungs out. Well done, Palesa. The fridge is miles away. My fridge is miles away, guys. I'm going, I'm going to cry until I bleed. That's a good one, Rutendo. Um, so the other example I have here is the blood bank needs a river of blood. Crying blood. Um, Lionheart says, I'm so tired I could pass out. Um, Lionheart, that could happen if you get too tired. Um, and Monica says she turned to a monster when she was angry. Mm, that's a good one. It's so hot I started melting. Well done. Cried my eye eyes out. I'm dying of laughter. Well done. <laughs> well done, guys. I'm so proud. Let's quickly move on to the next one. What is a personification? Oh, I might die if I don't meet Ariana Grande. Oh, Sarah. What is a personification, guys? Personification, anyone? Giving things human characteristics. Well done, Tyrese. Comparing non-human things to human traits. Well done, Monica. Okay, so personification is when you give human characteristics to inanimate objects, ideas, or animals. So for example, the sun stretched its lazy fingers over the valley. Does the sun have fingers? No, the sun doesn't have fingers. Who can give me an example of personification? Anyone can give me an example of personification? The kiss, the, the kittle whistled at me. Well done, Lionheart. The pencil stabbed me. <laughs> you guys have such beautiful examples today. Well done. Any more examples? The wind howled violently. Well done, Tino. Let's quickly move on, guys. If you want to get to today's poem, you have to move quickly. The, gra the dancing grass. The wind blew its cold breeze over me. The flowers dance in the wind. That's a beautiful one, Tyrese. Did the fridge just grow legs and run away? <laughs> Time runs so fast. Okay, let's move on to the next one. Imagery. Okay, imagery is using words to create a picture in the reader's mind. Okay, so there are certain words that we would use like the sun um, had its fingers over the valley. Those type of words. Okay, give us the image of a sun with fingers, which is completely not possible, but it sort of like paints the image of us of how hot it was. It's very descriptive words. Well done, Megan. Very descriptive words. And those are the type of words that are used in poetry in order to evoke an emotion. Then we have this type of poem that we're going to be quickly going through today. And this is the type of poem we call a free verse poem and a free verse poem is basically poetry that has no rules okay um and you can just write however you please and a lot of people or a lot of upcoming artists love to write um free verse poems so free verse poetry doesn't follow any rhyme scheme free verse poetry doesn't have any type of format um it's just a poem right it doesn't have a rhyme, yeah. So they say here, this does not mean it uses no devices. 
It just means that this type of poetry doesn't follow traditional conventions. Okay, so usually with free verse poetry, um, poets write free verse poetry because they are trying to express themselves about a specific issue that is going on. So usually free verse poetry is written when people just want to emancipate themselves or share a life lesson without feeling confined. Okay, so a lot of struggle poets used free verse poetry to express how they felt about struggles. For example, apartheid or the uh, slavery in America. A lot of free verse poetry was written by people who wanted to specifically free themselves from those restrictions in the past. Okay. Yeah, the example here seems very rhymy because remember, there's something we, we call rhythm in poetry. So usually songs follow a very rhythmic element. And songs are usually free verse, right? But they have a rhythm. So it doesn't mean that when a poem um, is free verse, it doesn't have any rhythm. Usually it does have a rhythm, um, but it doesn't follow any rules. Right, let's quickly look at rhythm. Okay, coming to rhythm. That was a very good um, question you asked, Tyrese. Um, so rhythm is the flow of the beat in a poem. It gives poetry a musical feel. Okay, so rhythm can be fast or slow depending on the mood and subject of the poem. You can measure rhythm um, in meter by counting the beats in each line. And I have an amazing example for you guys in the next slide. Okay, so here's a very beautiful poem. I love this poem because of the rhythm. Okay, um, rhythm is what gives the poem a beat. Okay, and Megan says something about punctuation. What about punctuation? Yes, there are like Cardi B's rapping. What about punctuation, Megan, before I start my favorite poem? Okay, Megan is quiet. Right, let me start with the poem. The poem is titled The Picketty Fence by David McCord. Right, and this is how it goes. The pickety fence, the pickety fence. Give it a lick, it's a pickety fence. Give it a lick, it's a clickety fence. Give it a lick, it's a lickety fence. Give it a lick, give it a lick. Give it a lick with a rickety stick. Pickety, 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 pick. Right. <laughs> Sarah says DJ Pearl. <laughs> Okay, let's do that together. Do it at home on your own. Okay, but let's do it together. It's a very, very, very nice poem that makes you feel like you're singing a song, but it's actually a poem. So let's go together in one, two, three, go. The pickety fence, the pickety fence. Give it a lick, it's a pickety fence. Give it a lick, it's a clickety fence. Give it a lick, it's a lickety fence. Give it a lick, give it a lick. Give it a lick with the rickety stick. Pickety, 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 pick. <laughs> oh my word. Um, I don't want to lick that pickety fence. Um, you don't have to lick it, but I just love how this poetry emphasizes rhythm. And I've highlighted specific words in the poem to sort of prove the rhythm um, in the poem. And someone is calling me Langa the Small. <laughs> Uh, I, I'm just doing my job here, guys, and I, I hope you enjoyed the rhythm. Okay, so the words that create rhythm are pickety fence um, and clickety fence and lickety fence and lick, 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 rickety stick, pickety, pickety, pickety. Okay, so um, poetry is very, very fun, guys. I'm sure you guys can see this. Poetry is very fun. There are a lot of elements that are used in poetry to ensure that a poem is fun and to ensure that the reader of the poem thoroughly enjoys the poem. <laughs> Bobbity, Bobbity, Boo. See, Lionheart, you got it. Lang had a small good one. That was, that's a really good one. <laughs> okay, let's move on to today's poem. So I need everyone to just focus, um, just calm down. Um, today we are doing a poem, right? The poem is called Reapers in the Mealy Field. Okay, and this poem 
is by Mbuyiseni Oswald Njali. Okay, Mbuyiseni Oswald Njali was born in 1940. He's a South African poet and he's also a teacher, right? Um, and he, Mbuyiseni wrote a lot um, in the 1970s, which was sort of like the peak of the apartheid era. So most of his poems were free verse poetry that spoke about all of the troubles that um, marginalized people went through um, through the apartheid era. So he's one of um, I, I, and I, he's one of the, uh, the iconic poets that usually spoke aloud about the struggles that um, marginalized people during the apartheid era went through. Okay, um, and his poems explore devastating effects of life under the apartheid era. So this is a very nice um, poem and a very knowledgeable poem that we're about to do today. Okay, so the characteristics of the poem that we're about to read and analyze today, um, it's this poem is written in free verse. And if you remember carefully, free verse poetry is poetry that is not, um, does not have any specific rules, does not usually have any rhyme, Tyrese, but it can have a rhyme. So um, it doesn't follow any rhyme scheme. Okay, it can have a rhyme, but doesn't follow any rhyme scheme. Okay, um, and with this, free verse poetry, remember I told you, poets usually write free verse poetry to sort of like um, speak about uh, an issue that they would like to emancipate themselves from. They would like to free themselves from the specific issue. Um, and usually like, like I told you before, poets write free verse poetry in order to emphasize how people want to free themselves from that situation um, and, and in order to view the struggles of, of marginalized people in whatever situation that is going on. So there's no rhyme scheme in the specific poem. There's no rhythm, but we have five stanzas. Who can tell me what a stanza is? What is a stanza? Just to check if you guys are still with me. A stanza is like a paragraph in a poem, right? So it has five stanzas, which are rich with sound devices and mainly similes and metaphors. Okay. Um, Monica, stanzas can be four or more lines. Okay. It's not only four lines. Yes, it's a collection of lines in a poem. And these, line, um, these paragraphs, these collections are divided by an empty line in between. So they're like in paragraph form. Okay, let's quickly look at what this poem is about. They say in this poem, Buyuseni Oswald Mjali points out the harsh conditions under which many laborers work he faithfully records the suffering of the workers as he evokes the tedium, the sweat, and the exhaustion of this kind of manual labor. Let's quickly read the poem, and if you can read it at home, read it with me. Reapers in the mealy field, faces furrowed with wet and wet with sweat, bags tied to their wasp waist. Woman reapers bend milly stalks. Break cobs in rustling sheets, toss them in the bags, and move through row upon row of maize. That was stanza one. Now we're moving on to stanza two. Behind them, like a desert tanker, a dust raising tractor pulls a trailer, driven by a pipe puffing man, flashing tobacco stained teeth, as yellow as the harvested grain. Stanza three. He stops to pick up the bags and loaded, he stops to pick up bags loaded by thick limbed laborers in vests baked brown with dust. Stanza four. The sun lashes the workers with a red hot rod. They stop for a while to wipe a brine bath brow and drink from battered cans bubbling with malty maheu. And stanza five, first is slacked in seconds. Men jerk bags like feather cushions and women become prancing wild bees. Soon the day's work will be done and the reapers will rest in their crowds. So we've read this poem about reapers in the melee field, but before you actually analyze a poem, you won't know the true meaning of the poem. So we are going to start with the analysis and I'd like you guys to listen carefully. We're going to start with stanza one. Okay, so in stanza one, it says, faces furrowed, 
and wit with sweat. In the first line, we are given an alteration of the words faces forward because they start with the letter F. And this is the repetition of the letter F, right? Emphasizes the deeply wrinkled faces of the workers in the mealy fields and how they are unhappy and how they are exhausted. That's why their faces are furrowed, and furrowed means wrinkled. And they are wet with sweat because they are tired. And they have bags tied to their wasp waist. And wasp waist is another alliteration which emphasizes their tiny waist. And this proves how hungry these workers are as they work in the meaty field. And this proves they are unhealthy and hunger state. Break cobs in rustling sheets, toss them in bags, and move through row upon row of maize. And we have an onomatopoeia in line number four, the word rustling. And it's a sound word describing the sound the sheets make. So in the first stanza of the poem, we are introduced to these workers in the mealy field, and they are described as unhappy, as exhausted. They have furrowed faces, and they are wet with sweat because they are tired. We also know that they have wasp waists because as they work in the mealy fields, they are hungry, they are unhealthy. Let's move on to stanza two. In stanza two, it says, in stanza two, it says, behind them, like a desert tanker, a dust raising tracker, a tractor pulls a trailer. So these women are working in the mealy fields. They are tired. They are sweating. And in stanza two, there's something else behind them. And to open up the stanza, right, the poet uses a simile that compares a desert tanker to a dust raising tractor, which basically means that they are working in very dusty conditions. So not only are they tired, not only are their faces furrowed, but they are working in very dusty conditions, which are leading them to be very dirty. Though this simile um, kind of emphasizes how dirty the environment is where they work. Okay, and this tractor, you could say it's bad weather conditions because there's a lot of dust here and we have people working here and they are not described as people who are wearing any protective masks. Okay. And then it says, this tractor is driven by a pipe puffing man. Another alliteration which emphasizes how much this man is a heavy smoker. That's good, um, Tyrese. This pipe puffing man is a smoker, flashing tobacco stained teeth as yellow as the harvested grain. Right. So this pipe puff puffing man is clearly more privileged than the workers because, number one, he gets to drive the tractor. And number two, he gets to smoke. He's not working. He's just driving and smoking, right? And he's causing all of this dust that could potentially make all of these workers sick. And they use a simile to describe his teeth. They say his teeth <laughs> are as yellow as the harvested grain. And they are comparing yellow teeth to harvested grain, which means this man's teeth are dirty. They are um, caused or ruined by smoke and they show lack of hygiene, and it emphasizes how much this man smokes. Right, stanza three. Stanza three, he stops to pick up bags loaded by thick-limbed laborers in this big brown with dust. So this pipe puffing man stops with the tractor, okay, to pick up bags that are loaded by thick-limbed laborers and this alliteration emphasizes how strong the men who work here are. And in the next lines, they use a metaphor, okay? And they are comparing the vests that are worn by the workers to bake bread, which kind of gives us the indication that the heat and the dirt of the working conditions are unhealthy for all of these workers. Their clothes are dirtied by the bad working conditions. Stands four. <clears throat> we almost done. The sun lashes the workers with a red hot rod. They stop for a while to wipe a brine 
bath, brow, and drink from the best of cans bubbling with multi mahil. So they are using a personification here to kind of emphasize how the sun is hot. It hits them hard. Well done, Tyrese, with the red hot rod. So it's basically hot. They are working in very bad, extreme weather conditions, right? And they stop for a while to wipe their brine bath, brow, another alliteration, which emphasizes exhaustion. Brine is like sweat, right? So they have all of the sweat um, on their foreheads on, on, and on their brows, right? And Mahil, um, some of you guys may not know what Mahil is. It's a drink. It's a mealy meal drink that is drank when cool. Um, Tyrese, brine is like sweat, okay? Brine is like sweat. So brine is usually what is used to marinate chicken. Brine is also like sweat, okay? They didn't get drunk, Lionheart. It's not a, a drink that is meant to get you drunk. Okay, it's a drink that is meant to give you energy. So after they've had this in stanza five, the final stanza it says, "Thirst is slacked in second seconds," which means that the thirst is quenched in seconds and the energy is revived. And because the energy is revived. Okay, let me quickly explain this because we're running out of time. Um, we, not, we don't marinate chicken in, in sweat. We actually marinate chicken with water, salt, and a little bit of sugar, okay? It sort of like pre-cooks the chicken. Then you would like marinate it with all your sauces and spices and stuff, then put it in the oven or fry it or whatever. So brine is like a mix of water and salt and a little bit of sugar. Right, um, <clears throat> this is slacked in seconds, which means the maheu, um, gives them energy. And because now they have this energy, men jerk bags like feather cushions. So all of these heavy bags that they pick up every day, because they have so much energy now, the poet uses a simile to describe how this mahewe has given them energy to put the bag, throw the bags onto the tractor like they have feather. That their job has become easier. And the poet uses another metaphor to describe how women become like horses. And they are dancing all over the place, moving very quickly to emphasize that the energy has been um, replenished after drinking mahil. Yes, the, the women are moving faster and the men are putting the bags of mealies onto the tractor like they are feather cushions. And soon the day's work will be done and the reapers will rest in their kraals. A nice poem, right? Right, and basically this poem points out the harsh working conditions that the laborers work under, okay? And the poet gives us record of the suffering of the laborers. But these laborers are so um, accepting because they drink the, the mahewu and they quickly go back to work, right? Um, did you guys enjoy today's poem? It's a sad poem, um, but it's always important for us to revisit such issues that we know what happened in the past and we can learn from it. Who enjoyed this poem today? Who enjoyed today's lesson? Yes, thank you guys so much for coming in today. If you have any other work that you'd like to email me, you can email it to me at langa.pearl at gmail.com. Thank you so much, guys, for coming in today. I will see you guys tomorrow, right? And tomorrow we'll be looking at writing and presenting um, business letter. Remember, we did a, a friendly letter on Monday. Now we're doing a business letter. So please tune in. If you feel like you need more information, you can always get us on www.africateamgeeks.co.za. You can email me langa.pearl at gmail.com. You can follow us on Twitter at African Team Geeks, or you can follow me at Perlings. You can also catch me on Facebook at Pearl Perling Langa. Thank you so much, guys, for joining in today's lesson. See you guys tomorrow. Bye.